Do you sometimes wonder if the White House thinks you're stupid? And do you believe Press Secretary Jay Carney really believes this? Today, we are focusing on the savings that millions of consumers have already seen because of the health care laws, provisions that ensure Americans receive more value for their health insurance premium dollars. Well, most Americans don't agree with Jay Carney. You've heard many horror stories right here on the record. And a new Associated Press poll shows 69% of Americans say their premiums will be going up. And 59% say their health plan's annual deductible or co-payment is increasing. Joining us is South Carolina Senator Tim Scott. Nice to see you, sir. Thank you, Greta. It's good to be back with you. So, Jay Carney thinks that millions of Americans are seeing savings. Re just remarkable. There's no way in the world you can add tens of thousands of government employees, have a $400 million website, and see premiums go down and not up. As a matter of fact, when you look at the facts, the facts are simple. People in South Carolina, Mr. Hooks from Greenville, South Carolina, sent me a letter, talked to him for a little while. His premiums are going up by 75%. His deductible is going from 10000 to 25000 but his premiums are going from 450 to over 800 a month. If he wanted to go to a copay plan, lower deductible, 1500 a month for a family of four. He, his wife, and two kids. Premiums are skyrocketing. But the unfortunate part is premiums are about price. Deductibles, copays, and out-of-pocket expenses, those are about the cost. The costs are also exploding. And unfortunately, we're going to see more bad news once the 7 million young people do not enroll, the next year, year two, the premiums will be based on the actuarial information, which will be dismal, which means we're going to have worse rates, not better rates. I don't, for the life of me, I can't figure out, though, Jake Carney is a smart guy. Yes. And why would he put his neck out on this? I mean, I mean, maybe he's going to get lucky and somehow this miracle is going to happen in the next six months and the price is going to come, come crashing down and make everyone very, you know, flush with cash. But, but right now it just doesn't look that. So why is, he, why is he sticking his neck out saying these things, that you know, these great savings? I have no idea. I can tell you this, though, that if they find a way to control the price on the front end, it only means that the cost will rise on the back end. If you can find a way to, to get a, an insurance company to provide an insurance policy that really isn't f rate sufficient, it only means that somehow, some way, taxpayers will pick up the tab on the back end. Well, that's, of course, you know, I mean, the American taxpayers have always been very uh, generous with the people who are sort of down and out. And as, as we expand things like Medicaid, quite naturally, it's going to cost more. I mean, some, I mean, someone's got to pick up the cost some, someplace. Well, in South Carolina alone, if we were to expand our Medicaid, we'd see another $2 billion of costs over the next 10 years. There's just no way. Well, what do you do about those people? I mean, like, I mean, I, you know, I, I assume that people in South Carolina don't want health people or people Absolutely. who are poor, who have health issues, not to be able to get medical care. What are you going to do about them? I was in most corner this morning talking about this very topic. And one of the things I suggested that we could do to lower the cost of health insurance, not to talk about health care, but to lower the cost of health insurance, we could allow for competition across the state lines. We could allow for small business owners to pull their employees together with other small business owners to reduce that rate by about 25%. Why, why didn't we do that? Why, you know, why didn't we do that? That's one of the failures of the pre-Obamacare world is that we had an opportunity to address things from a free market perspective, including medical tort reform. We didn't do it. So now we're faced with the challenge of trying to reintroduce common sense into the marketplace, and it would work. We could also fund health care insurance pools in states to provide those with pre-existing conditions with more opportunities. And the challenges get worse because the fact of the matter is that if you're in a group plan, pre-existing conditions are easily uh, absorbed into a large group plan. When you're in an individual market, there is no group, so you have to pay exceedingly higher rates to find your insurance. And that's going to be the challenge. That coupled with out-of-pocket expenses going from 6000 or so to as high as 12000 only means those folks who cannot afford insurance, they get the free health care checkup, but they can't take care of the challenges that they find within that checkup. What do we do next? What do they do next? I, that, I mean, that, and there, there is a heartbreaker. But let me ask you about something else. I want sure. to talk to you about the uh, bipartisan budget bill. The Senate is to vote on it this week, I think tomorrow. And under this bill, military retirement benefits will be cut by $6 billion over the next 10 years. So is it going to pass the Senate? I think it probably passes the Senate. I'm watching and listening to my colleagues on the floor just now when we were voting. It seems like the votes to get beyond closure, the 60-vote threshold, will happen, which means that you only need 51 for the underlying bill. The real challenge is if you're a young guy, you, you sign up for the military, you're 18, 19 years old, you get a promise. 
that promises that we're going to do what we're going to do for the next rest of your life. You retire at 42. You start looking for America to honor the promise. And we say, we made a promise, but we're going to break that promise by changing your retirement benefit. And for a 42-year-old E7 enlisted man, he loses about $75,000 in the next 20 years. You know, that sounds horrible. And, you know, I want to support our military in any particular way. But that's the same thing that we're hearing, like, in, when they restructure, uh, like, the, in, in Detroit, when all of a sudden people lose pensions or their yes. pension. I mean, that is always, you know, the situation. I mean, how do we accommodate that? What would you have done differently rather than, I, I guess I use the word penalize, rather than penalize the military in this instance, what would you have done differently? One of the things I'd love for us to have a serious conversation about in Congress is the fact that we have over 1,200 duplicative programs that cost the taxpayers 200 billion dollars. Here's an opportunity for us to reduce our spending, deal with our realities and our challenges face on, and not put that on the back of our military. But, and for the life of me, I can't figure out why that never happened. Senator Tom Coburn has been talking about all the duplicative Years. programs. GAO has the report every year, and everyone just ignores it. I don't even know why we pay for it. That's another expense. We pay for a report we ignore. We have Moroccan economic development plans that cost $26 million to American taxpayers. So, but, but why does that keep happening? There are a number of bills that suggest how we can deal with this in a, in a very pragmatic approach. It never finds But us. why? It, well, I would say call Senator Reid. Everybody call Senator Reid and ask him why won't he let these votes on the floor. So you blame him? Well, I, I blame the process. I certainly blame the leadership of the Senate today because at the end of the day, we're, we're not tackling the tough issues. One of the challenges even in this budget deal is we allow ourselves to have two more years of spending, but we're going to pay for it. The offsets happen over 10 years. Remember back to 2011 when we were going to pay for the increase in the debt ceiling over the next 10 years? Well, here we sit 24 months later looking for a new way to deal with our financial challenges. Well, so are you going to vote for this bill tomorrow? I'm not going to vote for this bill tomorrow. There's, there's just no way for I think it's a step forward. It's good that the, both sides are talking. That's good. We're having real pension reform. That's good. But there's two steps back. There's the ugly and the bad. The bad is the fact that we're paying for it over 10 years. The ugly is that we're asking our military to pay for it for us and not taking care of our responsibilities by cutting spending. We're simply shifting who pays in our current active duty military. That's well, ugly. What happens when we get to the debt ceiling issue uh, in February or March? Well, hopefully we won't have another one-year increase with 10-year pay for. <laughs> hopefully we'll do something more logical by looking at the underlying debt, giving ourselves an opportunity to have a serious conversation. It's good that Senator Murray and Congressman Ryan are having conversations. If we can continue that, perhaps we can find a real solution that actually cuts spending enough to have a realistic opportunity to have a discussion on the debt ceiling. Senator, always nice to see you, sir. Thank you so much. And straight ahead, new information about some Obamacare navigators. Should there be a criminal investigation? What are the navigators doing, and could it get you in trouble? Congressman Trey Gowdy is here next, and you can hash it out with us. We know you have an opinion about this one. Will Obamacare save your family money in the long run, or will it crush your finances? Tweet or post on Facebook right now. Just use hashtag Greta.